Welcome everyone to today's workshop with Dr. Jeremy White, uh, Enhancing Peer Review, Navigating the Journal Landscape, uh, sponsored by the Peer Support Group, the PSG. Um, there's a couple of things that I would like to make you aware of. Uh, first of all, my name is Kinsella Valis. I am the chair uh, for the PSG committee. Um, I would like to talk to you about some of the workshop house rules. Um, generally speaking, please keep yourself muted. If you do have a question, please use the raise hand function um, and you can ask questions throughout the presentation. Jeremy can answer. Um, please do make sure to follow the JALT rules of conduct. Um, basically, be polite and considerate to all members. Um, this is being recorded, so if you would rather not have uh, your face um, on the video, then please you can please feel free to turn off your video. If you want to change your name, you can do that as well. All right. So um, once again, I'm Kinsella Valis, and we are the PSG, the Jolt Writers Peer Support Group. Uh, coordinators are Jeff Carr, if you want to wave, uh, Cecilia Ikeguchi, Ikeguchi, sorry, Josh Kidd and Bethany Lacey. Hello, Cecilia. Yes, and hello, Bethany. Um, just to give you an idea of the flow of things today, um, there will be a word from our sponsor. Um, I will do a very, very short introduction to PSG to let you know who we are and what we do. Uh, then, of course, an introduction to Dr. Jeremy White. Uh, and then you'll take, take it away and start the workshop. Um, if you would like to write a question in the chat, um, please feel free to do so. But please be aware that these will be read at the end of the session and then answered in order. Um, for live Q&A, please use the raise hand feature. At the end, uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about our upcoming events uh, sponsored by PSG. Um, also, I would like to ask your cooperation uh, and help with a little survey to give feedback to our presenter, uh, Dr. Jeremy White, but also feedback uh, according, uh, recording um, some ideas about our workshop. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. So um, I said sponsored by PSG. We, we organize the workshops, but we also work together with um, other institutions such as the Student Peer Interaction Network Committee, uh, the Jalt Shizuoka chapter, um, the Ibaraki chapter, and Jalt Call. So I would like to ask today's uh, host, um, oh, I am so sorry, Robert. I just realized that it says Ibaraki chapter and it should say oh, Jolt. I have to change my, I have to change my res registration now. From, <laughs> from oh, well, I hope that's uh, not necessary, really. but my apologies for that. <laughs> but please go okay. take it away. Oh, um, hi. Uh, my name is Robert Swire. I am the coordinator uh, for Jolt Call. Um, I'm also kind of a neighbor of Jeremy White. So, so he lives about, 10 minutes down the road from me uh, and we are happy to sponsor him uh, for this um, what I can only assume would be an extremely exciting uh, presentation about uh, peer review or about uh, yeah about the peer review process so um, yeah so we're happy to be involved and, and we're happy to uh, uh, support this group this is my first contact with the writers peer support group I, I've known I've, I've heard the name before but I I'm happy to uh, to join and uh, to meet everyone. So thank you. Thank you very, very much, Robert. All right, we appreciate your support. Um, so if I could just say quickly a, a few words about the PSG, um, who are the PSG? Uh, we are a committee of volunteers, uh, adult members who are volunteers, but we are interested in reading academic manuscripts um, our goal is to provide constructive feedback to anyone who needs an extra pair of eyes on their work before they submit it for publication. Um, so we are almost at the, we are basically the same as a colleague whom you ask to read your paper uh, and give you some, some feedback, um, except that we are uh, neutral. 
yes, we are neutral. So we, we, but we are friendly and we are uh, very interested in helping out where we can. Um, the type of submissions that we accept and are willing to look at are abstracts, um, rough drafts, which means completed drafts, uh, which, which might still need a little bit of work. Um, you might want to ask us to look at certain sections that you are having trouble with, and we are happy to do that. Um, of course, polished manuscripts that you think are ready to be submitted, um, we are willing to look at those and give you some um, hopefully helpful comments on how to make it a little bit more perfect before you submit it for uh, for publication. Right. Okay. So um, here are so a little bit uh, of our contact information. Um, please feel free to go to jaltpublications.org. Um, we also have another JALT page um, that is the PSG Committee JALT page where you can find information about us. Um, feel free uh, to contact uh, any of our members, our coordinators at any time with any questions you might have. All right. Um, may I introduce our workshop leader, our presenter today, Dr. Jeremy White. Um, I will spotlight him first so that you can see him clearly. Okay, all right. So Dr. Jeremy White uh, received his PhD at Kyoto University. He's a professor at the College of Information Science and Engineering at Ritsumeikan University. He is also a very busy man, a co-editor of the Call e uh, EJ Journal. Um, his research interests are call mall game-based learning and digital stories. Um, but very important detail to know is that he enjoys ultra marathons for fun. Yes, feel free to ask him about any of these points um, today. All right. Um, I will stop sharing my screen and allow Dr. Jeremy White to take over. Um, please enjoy. All right. Thank you very much. Um, oops. One sec. I should share my screen first, shouldn't I? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, I assume you can see my slides now. It's all okay. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, today, uh, tonight. Um, I, I haven't used PSG myself, um, and I've been trying to figure out why haven't I used it before, and I realized it's basically because I'm never quite, I don't have enough time. I'm always submitting my abstracts and things uh, too close to the deadline. So um, that will be why I haven't used it yet. But I think it's a, an amazing resource that you have out there. I mean, people pay hundreds of dollars for professional um, editing services. So um, to have uh, a group of volunteers who are willing to help out, that's just amazing. So thank you for doing that. Um, yeah, so I'll get on to my talk today. Um, oops, what am I doing? Here we go. Okay, so uh, you've already had uh, my co-editor for the journal, um, Dr. Daniel Mills, um, who gave his nuts and bolts presentation. So um, here he is, Daniel Mills, a good friend, colleague, of mine we both work at the same university uh but one thing i should tell you is about his presentation is those were actually not nuts and bolts but they were wood wood screws and washers that he had up there before so um anyway um it's just something he was going to be here tonight so i just thought i'd point that out in case he turned up okay um a little bit of an introduction to me yes uh i've from Ritsumeikan University. I've been there for, this is my 12th year there. I've, I worked up from um, contract English teacher to uh, what I am now a tenured professor there. Uh, I'm in the College of Information Science and Engineering, but I've also um, worked in the 
business and economics department in the past. Um, I have a PhD, yes, from Akira University. Uh, actually, it's kind of fresh. I only graduated in March of this year. So uh, when I hear people say Dr. Jeremy White, it kind of it doesn't quite click yet that um, that's actually happened. Um, I am also a co-editor of Call EJ, and that is also quite fresh. We we took over the journal from um, Profes Professor Nozawa Sensei, or Professor Nozawa, um, who decided to retire after making the journal 20 years ago. Uh, and he's been doing it all by himself. And we took over in January, and two people are struggling to do it. So we have no idea here how he he managed to do it all by himself for that amount of time. Uh, and why am I qualified to talk about this tonight? Well, I've been involved in the peer review process for a long time. Um, I've had positive experiences with the peer review process. I've had negative exp experience with the peer review process. I've been accepted. I've been rejected many times. Uh, so I understand I think I understand what it's what it's about. So this is your manuscript up the top, the top picture there. When you first submit your manuscript, it looks like this. Just a standard car, nothing fancy there at all. Uh, and the job of the peer reviewer um, is to come in and to see how they can reform the car, enhance the car, make the car better based on what you have already submitted. Uh, so basically you're turning some standard sedan into the Batmobile is how you should look at it, I think. Now, a lot of some of the things today, uh, when I was doing my research for this, um, there was various articles and things that I came across, uh, but I found this quite interesting, and I'll talk a little bit about it, um, alternatives to the peer review uh, roadblock. Um, and it was it's, it's quite an interesting little read. Uh, it's an online download, so uh, I'll provide a link for that later if anyone wants to have a look at that. It's not. It's not such a long read, but um, I think it would be quite interesting for some people here to have a look at. So some journals, uh, this is the typical structure of the journal. That when your paper arrives, it goes to the journal administrator who uh, then sends it on to the editor and the editor has the first look at the paper and considers to do a disk reject or to accept the paper to send it to the um, to the editors and then to the and the editors will send it to the reviewers. Um, this is in the perfect world. Then the associate editors work with the reviewers to um yeah improve the paper basically and then it moves along through the production line this would be the perfect world in a perfect journal uh you have this nice group of people who are working together to make sure that your papers get published in uh, uh, a timely manner and that they go through a sufficient um peer review process to improve what you have submitted. But there's definitely some um, issues with the current peer review. So one of the biggest issues with the peer review process at the moment is uh, it's voluntary. So, and this is in, especially in our field um it's voluntary and it's a thankless job to be a peer reviewer um because you're anonymous as well so you get no credit 
for participating in the peer review process, except for the credit that would be written on the uh, website or the journal itself. Um, and the peer review process can be a bit of a, a roadblock uh, because there's delays or uh, people drop off. Um, and it can be a little bit of a frustrating time for editors. Uh, so, and the peer review process can take weeks, months. Um, I'm currently dealing with a paper that's been in the peer review process for a year. Um, and this is, especially what happened during the COVID time is uh, we received more and more papers because people were, uh, I guess the people were at home, they had more time to write more and more papers, but that didn't necessarily mean we had more and more reviewers to undertake the process. Um, so we also have this thing, well, the demand on peer reviewers is increasing. Uh, we don't have enough peer reviewers and we're asking them to do more and more reviews. Uh, the people who are active are getting asked to do more and more reviews. So quiet quitting has even reached um, the peer review section. Uh, and I was in a, um, it went to Eurocall last month and I was in part of an editorial forum there. And I was, one of the editors there was saying that as soon as he gets a paper, uh, he sends it out to five reviewers. And based on that, he said he's lucky if one of those reviewers replies to him and volunteers to do it. So, yeah, people are burdened with extra work, so they're finding it hard to participate in this. And we have a, uh, a lack of peer reviewers at the moment. So... How do we get peer reviews? Well, cold calling. Uh, and this is an example of a cold call uh, email I received for peer review just uh, yesterday, actually. Um, someone just emails me out of the blue and say, hey, would you like to do this peer review? Or would you like to be a reviewer for our journal? Uh, the other way that uh, we get them is recommendations. Someone says, oh, this person would be very good at doing a review. Um, or we, what we've done recently is we've put a call out to reviewers on our Facebook page, um, for example, and uh, we've got some people from that. Um, and the other way is to ask people who have already published with us, uh, well, you've published with us, would you like to participate and be a reviewer for us now? Um, the problem with the, the open call for reviewers is that a lot of the people who say, yes, I'd like to review, they're not qualified. Uh, they may have not even published anything in the past. They're just, um, they're interested and they, they have the enthusiasm, but they just don't have the experience to do it quite yet. Okay, um, so can I just see a raise of hands? How many people are actually peer reviewers for a, a, a journal at the moment? A peer, do peer review for a journal? Either virtually or actually raise your hand, either is fine. Okay, we've got a half there from Greg, okay. Um, all right. So I'm sorry if you already I, I know this, but I'll just talk about, huh, let's see there, thank you. Um, a little bit about the the journals. Um, so the, how the journals are classified, um, their rankings. Um, and of course, what a lot of people want to do is they want to aim for the top 
journals and how can you tell uh, if the journal that you're aiming for is one of the top journals? Um, so we've got the quarterly system. Uh, it goes from Q1 to Q4. And if you're a Q1 journal, that means you're in the top 25, the journal is in the top 25% for that uh, subject that you're, uh, or that the journal represents. So if I, our journal is computer assisted language learning, then if we're a Q1, we'd be in the top 25% for that. And so if you're a Q1, you attract more papers because people want to publish with you because it gets more recognition. Uh, and there's other things like uh, the impact factor as well, which I'll talk about soon. Okay. Um, Call EJ, yes. So that's the journal that uh, I am currently co-editor for. Uh, we received, last year, we received about 130 uh, papers in the year. Uh, and we published, I, sorry, as we said, I just took over this year. I think we published uh, 35 papers last year. So um, we do reject quite a few papers. Uh, and I showed you before the model of how a system should work. We're a much smaller journal at Call EJ. We have the editor who talked directly to the reviewers, like to, uh, the two of us, the co-editors, um, which is good in one way because we get to know the reviewers and get quite friendly with the reviewers. Um, but it, it's also a lot of work for Daniel and myself. Uh, so we're looking at expanding to create more of a uh, different system for that. I'm sorry if you can hear my cat in the background, it's just screeching at me now. Okay, and a little bit more about um, Call EJ. So uh, we are a Q1 journal for linguistics and language, but we're a Q2 for computer science applications. So we consider ourselves a Q1 journal. Uh, and people, this is probably why we get quite a lot of um, people submitting to us because we're considered a Q1. Um, our impact score, it's not particularly high. Uh, so for each uh, paper that we published, it gets referenced uh, 3.36 times in a year. Um, yeah, so that's our journal. Um, as I said, it's been going for about 20 years. Uh, at the moment, we've actually taken down our website because we just uh, want to completely renew the system. Uh, and we're working on all of that as well. So basically my talk is divided into the do's and the don'ts of peer reviews. And there seems to be a lot more don'ts than do's, but I'll go through the do's first. So when it comes to uh, starting the peer review process, and I think I'm definitely guilty of this as well, um, it's very important that we read the entire manuscript first. And for Call EJ, our manuscripts are between 6,000 to 8,000 8, words. Uh, so, you know, you sit down, you've got a 18 to 20 pages to read before you start the peer review process. And it's a little bit daunting. Um, but I really think it helps. Uh, if you read, read the whole thing, one time, then you get a good overview of the objectives the methods uh, and the findings and kind of a holistic view of things before you go in and start your um, actual review of the study. Uh, and even from the first reading, you can find out any sort of, um, you know, take some notes on any inconsistencies or things that uh, have popped up or any glaring errors um, or even ethical issues that, you, that you've come across 
um, when you go through your second reading. Um, yeah, and it also help you, assuming that this paper it fits into what you, your speciality. So from reading this paper, you would probably get a good idea of where this paper fits into the field already, uh, what sort of gap it's trying to solve. Um, one of the, the do's, based on my you know, research for tonight, that came up quite a lot is um, within the peer review process, we need to report if we have any sort of conflict of interest. Um, so, for example, yeah, computer-assisted language learning and in Japan, uh, it's a very small group of people. Um, so it wouldn't be uncommon for me to pick up a paper and go, oh, I know who wrote this. Even though it's anonymous, straight away I could tell who wrote this because I've seen their presentations before or they're a good friend of mine uh, and things like that. So if it's a good friend of yours, do you want to be the person peer reviewing? Is it ethical for you to do their peer review? I would say in that case, um, I would contact the author and say, hey, I'm pretty sure I know who this is. Could you find somebody else to conduct the peer review instead of me? Um, or just ask for a confirmation. Uh, is this, is this, if this is such and such a person's work, I don't think I'm the right person to conduct the peer review of this. Um, yeah, I mean, because we all have to be objective when we're doing this and we we are got to be concerned about the reputation of the journal, our own reputation as a peer reviewer uh, as well. Um, so that's enough about that one. The other thing, uh, there's... Peer reviewers, it's a scary process um, to receive a, a review from somebody else. And, you know, a lot of the time, a lot of the journals out there are anonymous. So um, I think that we should focus on the strengths of their arguments when we give our feedback. Um so the author has put a lot of work into this paper that they've submitted. Uh, and I think the last thing that uh, any peer reviewer wants to do is to make someone feel bad and to not recognize any the, the hard work and the contributions that they've made. So I think focus on the strengths of their arguments. I mean, of course, you need to highlight some negatives if there are negatives, but uh, focus on the strengths as well. Um, and if you build up your argument in a more positive way, it can kind of the guide the author um, and help them to refine and uh, build on their research uh, and improve the quality. So if you can receive your feedback in a positive way, uh, when you get that feedback, you think, oh, okay. The reviewer is okay with my research, but maybe I need to take it in a slightly different direction. Um, yeah. Having been on the, the receiving end of negative reviews in the past and uh, negative reviews that sound positive, uh, I'd much prefer the ones that um, have sounded positive um, even when they're, they're they're criticizing my work and justifiably so in some cases, um, but if it sounds more positive, then I'm much more open to receiving that feedback. Um, so, yeah, follow the review process structure of the journal. Uh, so as an editor, um, when we send a paper out to a peer reviewer. This means 
first of all, this means that uh, we believe this paper is a good fit for the journal. Uh, we wouldn't have sent it out to you if we didn't think it was a good fit for the journal. Um, we do have occasions where peer reviewers go, ah, oh, they reject it. Oh, this is good writing. Uh, great, 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 great. But it's not a fit for this journal. Well, if the editors sent it to you, it is a good fit for the journal. So please, I, you know, uh, I think if your editor has sent it out to you, then that means that they are interested in it and you should review it on its merits rather than whether it fits the journal or not. Um, the other thing is uh, the timeline. Okay. Um, when they review it, uh, when the editor tells you the amount of time that it needs to come back, please definitely stick to that timeline. Uh, and how they want you to review it as well. So I'll give you an example. This is how we currently do our reviews. Uh, we send them the paper, of course, and we send them these criteria, criteria that it needs to look through. Uh, they need to look through. Uh, it's pretty simple, um, and they've got one of four options: accept without change, revisions needed, not acceptable, not applicable. And then uh, down the bottom, the recommendations they can accept as is, uh, minor changes, major changes, or reject it. And then they have a more room down the bottom for their comments section. So this is our process. Uh, different journals have different things, of course, but um, please try and stick to that sort of process when you do a peer review. Uh, we do sometimes get people who uh, completely ignore this form that we send out to them and just send us the their result via email. Like, I think you should publish the paper and a few comments. So it's kind of... As, a, as an editor, it can be a little bit frustrating when that comes around. Um, divide your comments. So uh, you have high comments and low comments. Um, the low comments are comments that just focus on the spelling, grammar, format, for example. Uh, of course, they're important to, to focus on these things. Um, but they're not major and, um, these are things that the, the, the authors themselves should be able to fix. Uh, and if the journal has a copy editor, then that's something that the copy editor and the, the author could work, work through as well. Uh, I think the role of the reviewer is more just to focus on the, the the structure of the study itself, uh, the research questions, the methodology. So you should clearly look at those. You know, the literature is the literature up to date. So in a in a call journal, for example, where uh, I looking at um, our literature review, we don't really want uh, any literature that's older than five to ten years. When someone says a, a recent study and it's 10 years ago. Well, in the, our field, it's not recent. Um, yeah, so that's another thing that should be looked out there. So please do keep your uh, focus on the high higher level comments. And the don'ts. Um, yeah, there seems to be a, a lot more don'ts um, and This kind of goes into what I said before. Uh, don't try to become the the editor of the journal. Um, so the editors usually try to give you a paper that you um, kind of specialize in. Um, and they will make the decision whether it should be sent out to you or not. And again, focus on uh, just giving the high level comments for that. Um, yeah, I've talked enough about that one. Don't rush. So for our journal, we give you six to eight weeks 
uh, to complete your review. Um, if we get a review back within a week, it makes you think a little bit, well, uh, did this person actually spend enough time looking at the paper? Uh, of course, somebody might have spent a, a week going through it quite intensely, so it's a little bit difficult for us to judge. Um, but again, don't don't rush through it. You go through it, do it, one reading of it, maybe put it to the side for a little bit, come back to it, read through it again, and then do your more intense uh, review of it. Uh, as, as I said before, we, we've all got busy lives, um, things come up, we've all got other things on. So finding the time to do a review is, is difficult, but, um, I think it's important that we don't rush when we do these reviews as well. I mean, it's kind of, we need to give the author, um, the time of day basically. But at the same time, don't be late. Um, yeah, uh, as I said, we give six to eight weeks to do a peer review. Uh, some of them sometimes come in three months, even later than that. Um, and we uh, we send it out. They accept it. Uh, great. Okay, we wait the six to eight weeks. We send a little nudge. Hey, how's it going? And ghost. Okay, completely ghosted by them uh or like oh really sorry really sorry uh yep yeah, i'm on it and makes you wonder a little bit what's going on there as well um if you if you don't have the time for it uh when it gets sent out to you just be honest tell the author uh, tell the uh sorry the editor that you don't have time to conduct a peer review at the moment and they're not going to hold that against you. They realize that everyone has busy time, busy schedules and things. Um, the, the last thing you want to do is be, be the reason for a, a big bottleneck um, or someone not getting their paper published eventually. Um, yeah. So being a peer reviewer is a bit of a secret society. Okay, you, you have the privilege of seeing research before it's published, um, but you don't have to sign any confidentiality clause or anything. It's, it's an unspoken um, confidentiality. So please don't break the break that confidentiality um don't discuss this research with with anybody um unless you want to discuss it with the editor then that's maybe a different story but uh don't you know don't discuss it with your friends um i'm reading this great paper at the moment yeah even if it's fantastic you just you have to keep it to yourself um yeah this is uh I'll, I'll get more into this in a second with the reviews uh and this is one of the things that came up in my research there's there's actually a fairly common thing that reviewers ask the authors to cite papers that they have written um this is the thing and of course, it's quite unethical to ask people to cite your papers. Uh, uh, they don't know it's you that they you've been asked to cite, but um, yeah, just it's a pretty obvious one not not to do, isn't it? And the same sort of thing. Um, of course, everyone wants the journal that they're reviewing for to grow, but you shouldn't explicitly say hey you should cite more papers from this journal for example um that's a definite no no so this one was a bit of a 
shock to me when I did my research is peer reviewers who steal the research. So you get to see it before it's published. And, you know, you're holding it back. So some unethical peer reviewers out there steal the research, publish it before it actually gets published. Um, you can't take any ideas until it's published. Uh, you can't quote it until it's published. So you, you know it's coming out. That's great. And you can have your ideas ready to go. But until that's been officially published, hold back, wait, and <laughs> no stealing, please. Of course, this group would never do that. I know that. Reviewer number two. Um, there's a whole thing online about uh, reviewer number two. Um, and reviewer number two creates fear and dread in people who publish. Uh, so you have reviewer number one who is very nice and positive and gives some of the, the high... Uh, good high comments that we're talking about before. Uh, and then in contrast, you have reviewer number two, who is the comments are not constructive. Um, and they kind of use their being anonymous uh, as a way to look down on uh, the people that they're reviewing for and can be can be quite smug. And, you know, if they've got some, as, as it says in there, some pet issues, they really, really focus on those pet issues within there, which maybe they're valid, maybe they're not. But, um, yeah, I, I've had reviewer twos in my life. Uh, it does happen. And um, we need to kind of try and stamp this out, I believe. So let's just go through an example. So yeah, as I said, I recently attended a um, uh, editorial forum at uh, Call EJ, uh, sorry, um, Eurocall. Um, and this is from the Recall Journal, which is part of Eurocall's, um, what is Eurocall's publication. So they've got a quite a high compared to us anyway, uh, 4.5 impact factor of 4.5. Um, and their acceptance rate is only 14%. So they reject a lot of their papers. Uh, I'm sorry. And they're also a Q1 journal, the same as us. Uh, and that was quite interesting to see uh, this is where I got this from. So they have the proper structure of the uh, of the journal. Yeah, and this was the one that I found very interesting. Um, so they reject sixty percent of uh, the papers straight out that come. Uh, sorry, in 2015, uh, in 2021, they rejected over 80% of the papers straight away. Uh, so there's a lot of papers that are, are being rejected before they even get to see uh, a reviewer. But then within those ones that do get accepted, um, they're going through many, many reviews. The ones that get accepted after just one review session is very minimal. And all the way up to six reviews. And this is something when you decide, yes, I want to be a peer reviewer, you need to uh be it's like adopting a pet you have to be there from review one right through to review six the paper 
will keep coming back to you. So you have to have the time, the energy, uh, and the the willingness to stay involved with it. So six re- reviews that might be well over a year of seeing this paper come back to you every time. So you need to be prepared for that. In saying that, at the same uh, forum, there was one journal that said that they only set, accept up to two reviews. Um, then after two reviews, if it's not accepted, they reject it straight out. And the uh, argument was for that is uh, diminishing returns. So after each review, they res- they they get less and less returns from that review process. So um, there's an interesting way to do it. Uh, my journal, generally, we just keep on sending it back to the authors and keep on bugging our peer reviewers to have one more look at it, one more look at it, one more look at it. Uh, and which is the better way? I don't know. I didn't realize that people would reject it after two reviews. I only found that out last month. And so now I have to go back and discuss with uh, Daniel to see if maybe we should change our way of doing it or stick with what we're doing at the moment. So another thing uh, as editors, we, because people, uh, reviews are quite subjective. Um, the peer review process is quite subjective and you get two people, they read the same paper and they can come to quite different conclusions. Uh, so we have, this is reviewer one of a paper that came back recently. Um, and this reviewer said, accept pending minor changes. So you can see um, most of what they wanted was acceptable without change. And just a couple of things they said revisions needed. Move on to reviewer two. Reviewer two, there were three things that they said revisions needed, but they told us that the paper should be rejected. So as an editor, what we have to do from that, if we get one accept, uh, one accept and one reject, then uh, in our journal, what we do is we find a third peer reviewer to have a look and to make the final decision. Basically, uh, we have to go with uh, the majority out of the three of them. Um, but this, again, it can slow down the process because these have come back after six to eight weeks, but we have, then we have to find one more reviewer. So it takes another six to eight weeks. Uh, and so the the authors can get quite frustrated that they're not getting their um, paper back in a timely fashion. But if we send it back to them at this stage, then we might have to just reject it. So another thing that came out of the forum uh, about peer review, should reviewers get paid? And maybe this is something we can discuss a little bit at the end of the, the presentation. Um, so there was a, I actually brought up this question, you know, uh, all of our journals at the moment, they're, they're free to um, submit to, but in the science world, you have to pay a lot of money. You could pay thousands of dollars to submit your paper, uh, but the peer reviewers in the science world also receive no money. So is it time to start paying our peer reviewers? Uh, well, the arguments for not paying the peer reviewers is uh, basically um, if you're paying somebody to do a peer review, then they sort of feel obliged to give a good review of the paper because it's been paid for. That was the, the argument that came out of that. Uh, and should reviews be open? Well, there are more and more journals that are switching from the anonymous peer review 
to the open peer review. And I'll show you a couple examples now. So uh, Ludic Language Journal, uh, this was founded by uh, Dr. James York and Dr. Jonathan Dehan, both from uh, in, in Japan. And this is a game-based learning uh, journal. Um, and it's completely open review. And so when you submit to them, you have, uh, of course, the author's names here, you know, Dehan J is the author. And then under that, you've got the three, four people who reviewed this paper. Uh, so Jones, Jones, Jones. Uh, yeah, and they, they all reviewed the paper. Is this the way we need to go with peer review? Is this what needs to happen in the future? Or uh, should all the JALT journals um, become more open like this? Well, and uh, Dr. Swire is in here. Osaka JALT has also switched to an open uh, review system. So you can see who is uh, reviewing your paper, I believe. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Bob. Um, but this is maybe, this is the way that reviews will uh, happen in the future. So there's a little bit more accountability for your review and you can't hide behind being anonymous. Um, but the the downside of this, if we switch to more open peer review, then there could be less and less people willing to spend the time and volunteer their time to undertake uh, the peer review process. So <laughs> which one is better? I don't know. Um, so if I had a few minutes left out, so if I had to give you five simple guidelines to conducting a peer review, the first thing is when you get offered uh, a chance to do a peer review, do you have the time? Okay. Uh, excuse me. Don't just say yes. Uh, because you think you need to say yes, or you think it looks good on your CV. Think about your work schedule. Think about everything like that. Do you have the time? And as I said, this is like adopting a pet. You could be, depending on the journal, being involved, be involved in this review for a year. So you, do you have this one year period that you could periodically spend doing this? Um, are you the right person for the article? <clears throat> um, so just because you receive an article, just because you've said yes to an article and you receive it, doesn't necessarily mean that you uh, need to do it. Uh, you shouldn't feel guilty about having to do it. Um, have a look at the, the paper. And once you read through it, um, you might realize that actually this is not really uh, my area of expertise. And then you could talk to the editor and say, Hey, I'm, I'm still interested in doing peer reviews for you, but this particular one is, uh, out of my wheelhouse. I don't understand exactly what to do. Um, we had one recently that, um, I sent it out to him. He read through it, came, got back to me within a day and said, Hey, um, I want to peer review, do peer review for you, but I'm, I'm sick and tired of doing peer review about COVID-19 papers. So, uh, okay, fine. I'll find another paper for you to review and send this to someone else. <clears throat> um, yeah, so the third one there, are you in the right frame of mind to do peer review? Uh, I mean, <laughs> that's a pretty simple one. It's... It kind of comes to do you have the time? Are you in the right frame of mind? You know, if you're job hunting next year, is it the right time to, you know, you need to be writing your CVs and things for jobs? Is this the right time to 
focus on doing a peer review. Uh, for reviewers, you would like others to review you. So as I've said through here, you know, I even if I get negative feedback, I like to receive it in a more of a, a positive way. Uh, if that's the way that you would like to receive your feedback, then conduct yourself in that manner. Um, hopefully there's no one here that enjoys getting negative feedback um, in a negative way. Um, so focus on those those high comments, uh, positive reinforcement. And we're all doing the same thing. We're all trying to publish papers. We're all working to improve ourselves in that way. Uh, and five kind of backs onto that. Make your comments specific and useful. Okay. Um, and that's really about all I have to say. But I have a question for you. After all of that, do you want to be a reviewer? So, yeah, I'm quite happy to open it up to uh, any questions, comments. I didn't see anything in the chat. So um, if anyone just wants to talk to me, I'm quite welcome. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for a very interesting presentation. I would like to ask everyone uh, if if you are willing to do so to unmute and please give uh, Dr. Jeremy White a round of applause. Yes. All right. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay. And of course, questions, questions, please feel free to type now in the chat box or speak up. Feel free mm -hmm. to unmute and ask a question. Oh, there's a question, Christine. Hi, yeah, hi, I'm Christine Kuramoto in Hamamatsu in Shizuoka. And um, I was wondering if it might not be a good idea to have one reviewer who's not an expert in the topic being written on in order to, because don't we read journals to learn new things and to sort of have a look at if that person feels like they're really learning or picking up the methodology of the research through what mm. was written or not. That's an interesting way to, I hadn't even thought about that before, but you're, you're quite right. That could be a way that, it, excuse me, um, that it could be done. You have one expert and one novice on the subject and the novice can look at things from a different perspective and pick up things that the expert might not pick up so yeah definitely that's something i hadn't thought about before but thank you thank you very much christine are there any other questions Yes, a question from Betlinde. Go ahead. Okay. So if you can see me all things, let's see. Okay, I have a question. Um, there was you mentioned it. It's a kind of secret service. The whole thing. What can you say? For instance, can you write in a CV that you are, that you are a reviewer of this and this journal? What is allowed yes. to say? And what is allowed not to say? Uh, absolutely, you're allowed to write that you are a reviewer for this journal, um, and you should give yourself credit for that. Um, and you should check the journals that you review for to make sure that your name is in their credits, um, in their list of reviewers. Uh, I, I don't think you can say that you reviewed this specific paper. Um, yeah. Um, so you can just say that you're a reviewer and you could even mention how many papers a year that you review for this um, journal. We, we have some reviewers who are very, very active and we'll probably review three or four papers a year. And we have some who are not active and, and always say that they're too busy to review. So credit yourself and then maybe say how many papers a year that you review for that journal. Mm -hmm. And we, sorry, we send out a certificate every year as well for the um, 
to the reviewers to say, hey, thank you for your, your time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Something in the chat. Yes, there's a comment in the chat. Indeed. Okay. Yes. Um, can you can you see the chat, Jeremy? Or yes, yeah, yeah. So, okay. uh, it goes back to the the first question. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, Christine's idea is good, and something I'll discuss with Daniel from now. <laughs> oh, thank you. Are there any further questions or comments? Don't be shy, please speak up. I also wanted to say regarding that last question that um, I've worked at universities where there's a point system and when we do review papers, which I'm I'm not a reviewer now, but I have done in the past. Um, and it is related to how we are scored and our bonus that we get. So I think if you are a full-time um a full-time teacher at a university, it, it might be beneficial to you to keep track of that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's see if there's anything else in the chat. Okay. Okay, it seems that All right, Greg has a question in the chat. Now. Oh, Greg, okay. Sorry, I did not see that. Go ahead, Greg. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, our journal, uh, sorry, the question is, does your journal give advance indication of what articles might be wanted for the future editions? Uh, we give some basic topics of what we're we're interested in seeing. Um and usually, I mean, call is a fairly general field. So usually the things that we get are related to that. Uh, we do get the occasional thing that has absolutely nothing to do with call, but that's usually someone who's just blanketed, sent out their paper to, to several journals and in the hope that it gets published somewhere. Sorry, Greg, I think you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, so I mentioned this question because uh, you you brought up the, the fact that some reviewers didn't want to read another uh, article about uh, something related to COVID-19. And so I found in the yeah. past when I was doing this kind of work that uh, we get a, an abundance of a certain type of article. And so we try to um, tell writers, future writers to the journal um, as much as possible what sort of things we're looking for in the future edition yeah. yes yeah and i'm expecting ex well we have already but i'm sure it'll be more explosion of chat gpt articles um will be coming and there might be a time where we're like okay that's that's enough on that subject unless you've got something really new to talk about in that way Thank you very much. Great question. Uh, are there any more questions? Just oh, uh, Jeremy, yes. if it would be okay. Uh, the topic that just came up about the journal giving advance indication or maybe looking for uh, articles to be written on certain topics or papers on certain topics brings to mind the way that conferences will often try to shape the content of the conference by offering certain tracks or subtracts or requiring certain keywords for uh, proposals and that sort of thing. And I wonder, do you think that uh, journals would have journals that you've worked at try to shape the narrative of the journal more or reflect the narrative of the people who are doing the research in the field more? Or is it not really an either or question? Um, the journals I've worked with haven't really tried to shape it so much. They're just, they're happy to accept, um, any good research articles in the, in the field. Um, 
I guess special editions um, where they come up with a specific topic that they really want to to focus in on is more where that occurs. And then you've got your regular publication where um, it can be more general. And special editions, um, we get requests for special editions all the time. People who want to have this topic and get a several different authors to put a paper together on this topic to have this special edition. Do you mind if I ask um, where do those requests come from sort of in a, a general way and how are they uh, debated and decided on by the editorial right. staff? Um, so a lot of them actually come from uh, conferences. So conferences have don't have a publication and so they've got a theme that they were interested in uh for the for the conference they're interested in this theme and they've gathered these ideas so then they want to gather the papers on those ideas and but they need a journal to use so they come to us and say hey how about this um we have had some just some um authors who are interested in just like they've called cold cold us uh, basically to say hey we're interested in get, gathering some papers on this topic uh are you interested in publishing it um and uh in general we haven't accepted those at the moment um but we've we've leaning more towards accepting the um conferences uh themed ones why is that uh we the conferences we know more about the systems um so the conferences who are interested are quite established uh and we we know who the people are uh and the the author there's just the sole author who emails us we don't really know anything about this this person or the um so when they when they do these uh, want to do these special issues, they don't use our reviewers, and we see nothing of the the papers. They are separate to us, and then just come to us at the end, like, okay, can you now publish this? So we want to be careful about who we are allowed to do this because we have to be careful about the integrity of our journal and what sort of level of papers we allow to be published. If that makes sense, Understood. it does. Thank you. Um, I would actually also like to ask a question, Jeremy, if that's all right. Sure. Um, so your last question on the screen right now, do you want to be a reviewer? Imagine that there are people in this in this workshop. Who's, yes, uh, I'm not yet a reviewer. I would like to be a reviewer. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps I don't have uh, as much experience as a as a published author, maybe one or two papers. Um, I do read a lot of a lot of papers. I enjoy that. Um, and what would you suggest that a prospective reviewer do to prepare or feel prepared once uh, they are called upon to be a reviewer? Or <laughs> is there even a place they can offer their services? Yes, PSG. You can join them and uh, do <laughs> Thanks some, for that. <laughs> some reviews for them. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, uh, I if you're interested, in a specific uh, topic or a specific journal, I would contact them and say, hey, I'm interested in becoming a reviewer. Here is my CV. Uh, uh, do you think I have what it takes or what do you think I need to do to become a re reviewer? Um, and you might find that they are interested in you straight away or um, they might start you off on something a little bit more simple like a book review. Um, which are generally fairly good anyway. Um, so you can have a little bit of practice with a book review and then move on to um, shorter papers and then to featured journal papers in the future. There, there might be a process for each journal. Uh, we don't have that process, but it's definitely something we should look into in the future. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I can imagine that some people interested in being a reviewer just don't have that that confidence boost. So what you're saying is just go ahead, have that confidence and put yourself Absolutely. out there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. And please don't use chat GPT. 
D to um, review <laughs> journal papers. Right. I'm sure it's happening somewhere. Um, somewhere. Okay. Um, may I ask if the if there are any more questions? Um, we are uh, about to reach our the end of our workshop, the time that we have allotted for our workshop. Are there, but if you do have another question, please feel free to ask. Um, Jeremy, would you mind uh, unsharing your uh, your oh, yeah. presentation for no one problem. second? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, um, I'd yep. just like to say once again, thank you so much, uh, Jeremy, for a very interesting presentation and thank you for answering our questions today. Um, we really appreciate your your time and, and expertise. Um, if possible, I'd like to steal two more seconds of everybody's time just to uh, mention a couple of things uh, regarding um the woo wow okay let's not share that sorry about that um about our next workshop um that is coming up which will be uh presented by Chalana White uh and i'd just like to to share no that with you yeah <laughs> yes it's it's quite interesting two two whites yes we have two <laughs> whites um so dr jeremy white and chalana white um, and both will have quite interesting presentations. Uh, well, we've had a very interesting presentation from Jeremy, and I'm sure that Chalana's will be of interest as well. Um, she's going to talk about my experience or her experience as a new reviewer. And uh, as Jeremy has said, uh, new reviewers can be very, very experienced um, or not experienced at all. It is whether you are interested in being a reviewer and um, giving up your time and helping another person. At least that is from the point of view of the PSG. Okay, so um, you can either scan this QR code or visit our PSG webpage or JALT webpage and uh, register for Chalana's presentation on December 2nd, uh, 2 p.m. Okay, so thank you again very much. And um, if you are coming to JALT uh, in uh, Tsukuba, this year, please feel free to uh, join us at 5.30 on Saturday the 25th for a forum in which we will be talking about author and reviewer experiences um, in PSG, but also outside of PSG. We will have Jerry Talandis and Joseph Michael speaking. All right. Thank you once again. And if I may ask you to... Uh, please fill out, uh, it's in the chat box, this survey, um, which will give some feedback to Dr. Jeremy White, but also give the PSG an idea of how you feel about the workshops and uh, your, your interests at large. Thank you very, very much. Feel free to scan the QR code as well. Um, and that is all from us today. Um, this uh, presentation will be, or this workshop will be on the JALT um, YouTube channel so you can review it um, and, and of course share with others who might have missed this workshop or might be interested in hearing more about uh, peer review. Right. Um, that is all from me. Thank you very, very much. Um, thank you, Joss Call. Thank you, Jeremy White. And thank you, uh, attendees today. Have a lovely evening.